Okay, so I promised you a question on an isothermal atmosphere and working out the pressure in an isothermal atmosphere as a function of height, okay, as a function of altitude above the Earth's surface. So we can do that, um, but first we might want to talk about the ideal gas equation. So air is a pretty much ideal gas. Okay, It's uh, not got very strong intermolecular bonds between any of the, the molecules in in air particles, a lot of them are diatomic or non-reactive, um, so there aren't going to be very strong van der Waals forces there, so there's no need to worry about it not being ideal, that uh, approximation is pretty good. So what's the equation of an ideal gas? Um, that's PV equals nRT, and you can of course use PV as nKVT, uh, using Boltzmann's constant and the number of molecules instead of uh, the number of moles and the gas constant. Um, these are effectively the same equations because uh, this gas constant is actually equal to KVT, uh, sorry, KB over Avogadro's constant. And if you put that in here, the number of moles divided by Avogadro's constant, that would give you the number of particles that you have. Okay, so we don't really want to work with um, volume and number of moles or number of particles. Instead, we want to use density. So what we could do is if we take this top equation and we divide by volume, then we get this sort of expression, the number of moles divided by volume um, times R times T. Okay. But if I multiply here by uh, the MR, of the gas in question, so in our case the MR is just the MR of air, then this in fact is the density, right? The number of moles times the MR is the density. I mean, sorry, it's the mass and then divide by volume, that means it's density. But we can't just do that, we want to divide by MR here as well. Okay, so that's put it in a nice form that I like. Um, so I could call that pressure equals density. Um, times this RT over MR, okay? And I will give this a, I'll give this a sort of constant, I'll just call this mu, okay? So we're probably gonna use that constant later, but for now, just to simplify our equations, we'll just call it mu, okay? So because it's an isothermal atmosphere, we can assume that the uh, temperature is constant, include it within this constant, and we can just say that pressure is therefore kind of proportional to density and the proportion, the uh, constant of proportionality is this mu. All right, so now we can write it in this form. We can actually use um, this, this equation again, this change in pressure equals the density of the air times gravity times height, change in height. Um, but we don't really want to use it in this way around. We probably want to use it sort of starting from the Earth's surface. So usually when we're using this equation, we've got like a sort of tank of fluid and we drop something in it and we say, oh, the, you know, the pressure's gonna go up as, as the depth of the object in the, in the fluid increases. Instead, we wanna say we're going to sort of rise from the bottom and this Z can be the coordinate of our altitude. And if we do that, we can sort of rewrite this as our change in pressure is going to be negative rho G change in Z. And if I take a small enough change in height, then there's going to be a small enough change in pressure. I can actually write this as a sort of differential equation. Uh, dp dz equals negative rho G. And this is often called the hydrostatic equation. Okay, so if you're in sort of hydrostatic equilibrium, this is true. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to rearrange this to solve for a function of pressure with this coordinate z. So I can write pressure um, is equal, well, pressure divided by this mu, this constant, is now equal to my rho. If I insert that in this equation, I can now say dp dz is equal to um, minus p uh, over mu times g. Okay, now this is a differential equation and it's actually a, you know, a nice one, it's a separable one. So 
I can divide by p and then multiply by my dz and take the integral. So I'm going to do that. So that would give me dp over p is equal to minus g over mu dz and taking the integral. So I need to put in a constant uh, sort of boundary conditions and I can do that either at the end or I can put it into my into my integral here. So you really shouldn't have uh, the same kind of letter here as one of the bounds to your integral as you have in the integral. So I'm going to put a little dash here. I'll show you why in a sec. So if I start from ground zero, so I'm uh, starting from an altitude of zero and go up to an altitude z, that's why I have this dash here. So I don't want to be integrated by something that's also in the bound. Um, then what does my pressure start at? Well, it starts at atmospheric pressure, which I'll just call PA, and it goes to a pressure P. Okay, same reason I put the dashes here. So when I integrate this function uh, on the left-hand side, I will get a natural log of the pressure over the atmospheric pressure. So I know it's going to be a natural log of pressure, take away natural log of the atmospheric pressure, just putting in these two bounds. So I divided and took them away. And on the other side, it's going to be rho g mu, uh, sorry, no rho, g over mu uh, multiplied by z. Okay. If I rearrange this expression, I can get a nice form for my um, sort of adiabatic, sorry, not adiabatic, that's the next one, isothermal atmosphere. So my isothermal atmosphere has a pressure that changes with z that's equal to sort of a decay, an exponential decay in pressure. So it's going to be a minus uh, g over z. Okay, that's nice. So can we kind of think about what our atmosphere is going to look like um, under these kind of conditions? And yeah, we can. So as I already said, this is an exponential decay. So we know it starts at our atmospheric pressure, and then it kind of increases exponentially like this. Probably needs to be a bit sharper to be exponential, really, but that's the sort of shape that we're looking at. And something really useful, um, really useful to know, would be kind of this. Uh, I'm going to call it z one half or half height or something like that, decay constant, which is equivalent to kind of like your half life in a radioactive decay. It's when your pressure drops to half the the atmospheric pressure at ground level. So if you do that, all you need to do is sub in um, pressure over 2 in here. So PA over 2 in here is equal to atmospheric pressure E to the minus G over mu Z half. Okay, then I'll cancel with the atmospheric pressure on both sides. Um, and I'll put everything, I'll take the reciprocal of everything here. So I'll go 2 is equal to E to the G over mu um, Z half. Okay, so then if I take the natural log, I can say natural log 2 is equal to um, g over mu z1 half. Okay, and I can move these, these bits to the other side and just call it mu ln 2 over g is equal to my z to the well, not z to the half, z half, my sort of half height of z. Okay, I shouldn't put it up there, that looks like an indice. There we are, that's better. Okay, so maybe we can put some numbers to this and see actually sort of how high um, this atmosphere would go. So let's see, what do we say mu was again? Mu is RT over the MR, okay, over the molecular um, mass of air. Okay, so we can use some numbers for that. Um, so let's use T is equal to 300 Kelvin. Okay, so that's kind of the temperature on the Earth's surface. So yeah, that's a reasonable prediction. It's maybe a bit high. That's kind of more like, I guess, more like room temperature. But we'll hold with that for now. Um, let's use R is equal to 8. I know it's 8.31, but we can sort of just... Just uh, think of it as being sort of, you know, kind of a, a just a rough estimate. This one, okay. The MR 
is going to be, well, what is the uh, well, Earth's atmosphere mostly made up of? I would say it's about 20% PMR of oxygen and 80% PMR of nitrogen. Okay. Now, the MR of O2 is, is 32 grams per mole, and the molecular mass of nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen, is 14 grams per mole. Uh, actually, 28, sorry, grams per mole. So if we, if we sort of put these two in, we can work out a sort of number for this mu. Um, in fact, it's kind of going to cancel with the 8 on the top. Okay, it's kind of going to cancel with the 8 on the top. So let's see what this is going to look like. So mu is going to be equal to 0 0.2 times 32. Actually, this is, this is all on the bottom, isn't it? Yeah. Let me just put that on the bottom. Okay, so 8 times 300 over 0 0.2 times 32 times, oh, sorry, plus 0 0.8 times 28 and all of this on the bottom would be times 10 to the minus 3 because this is in grams per mole we actually want it in, in kind of kilograms per mole okay staying sticking to SI units so times 10 to the minus 3 so I'm going to cancel with the 8 with some stuff on the bottom here so I cancel 32 and the 8 I can have a 4 there instead and this 8 I can just put a 0 0.1 there instead okay so 0 0.2 times 4, that is 0 0.8, okay, and 0 0.1 times 28 is plus 2.8, okay, so that's, what is that, like 3.6 or something, um, so that's roughly 3, right, that's roughly 3, I'm going to cancel all of that with my 300, okay, make that 100 on the top, and that's a 10 to the minus 3 on the bottom, okay, I'm going to cancel that with my sort of, well, I'm going to add it on to my 10 to the 2 on the top and make this equal to 10 to the uh, 5. Okay, 10 to the 5. Now, I'm actually dividing this number by G and timesing it by ln 2. So when I do that, I've got 10 to 5 divided by G, that's 10 to the 4, so that's sort of 10,000 meters. And then times ln 2, which is something like, I think, about 1.7. Okay, so... This is about 10,000 meters times 0. So times 1.7. That's uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 4. Okay, 1.7 times 10 to the 4. Now, what does that look like when we think about it in sort of human terms? Okay, that's that's 17 kilometers. Okay, 17 kilometers. Now, does that seem reasonable? Um, well, let's sort of think. This is just an estimate, so I've made some kind of assumptions all over the place here, um, including some, some you know, quite, uh, quite inaccurate cancellation. But this is the kind of thing that they might expect you to do, make a sort of ballpark estimate for something. And as long as you're not a factor of a hundred out, then, then you've you've made a you know a good a good attempt at this kind of question. So, in fact, this is pretty reasonable because. If you, I think the sort of height of the atmosphere, I would say, is about um, 100 kilometers, I think, to the sort of up to the ionosphere or something like that. Um, if we want to keep halving this pressure, what, what if we said, like, once we're down to kind of a sixteenth of the pressure, uh, of atmospheric pressure, because, of course, this is never going to go quite to zero. So we could do a sixteenth or a thirty-twoth or something like that. If we've halved it four times, then that would be 4 times 17. If we halved it 5 times, that's 5 times 17. 5 times 17 is about um, 100 kilometers, right? So if you go down to sort of 1 32th of the atmospheric pressure, then you're at roughly your 100 kilometers, okay? Uh, you're not quite there yet. Maybe you need one more, so 164, something like that, just to get over 100 kilometers. Um, but as we said, this is never going to quite drop to zero. So, you know, there are there are sort of faults in this problem because um, you're treating it as as a sort of continuous, you know, um, a continuous medium. Whereas we know that it's actually made up of particles, and eventually you will get to a point where there are no more particles. So the pressure will drop to exactly zero. Um, but uh, 
but yeah, this is a, this is a reasonable estimate, I think. Um, it doesn't really work because, of course, it isn't adiabatic, the atmosphere, um, but it's not far off, right? This is not a far off assumption. Um, in fact, we could do a better example where we actually show uh, what an what an adiabatic atmosphere would look like, not an isothermal atmosphere. Okay, so I think I might have said adiabatic then. I meant I meant isothermal. Um, so an isothermal atmosphere is, you know, it gives a reasonable estimate, but kind of for the wrong reasons, because we know for sure that it's it's actually not a constant temperature. And we could show um, we can show actually a better example of when it is adiabatic, which means that we sort of um, conserve entropy. Okay. Um, or we, we say a, part, a pocket of gas that moves through the atmosphere would, would have a constant entropy. Okay. All right. So that's a pretty tough question. If they ask you to do something like that, um, then, then yeah, that's quite difficult. It involves a little bit of integration. And it's not integrating integrating x and y, so some people might find that a little bit alarming. But in physics, we do this all the time, right? We we're expected to integrate things that are not necessarily x and y. They might be pressures or heights, volumes, you know, surfaces, you know, that kind of thing. It's it's fine to do that, and this gives a, a reasonably good um, estimate for the height of the atmosphere. So you know, it's not a not a uh, not a terrible question. Okay, great.